On the one hand, this could be the strangest place I've done one of these weekly updates. On the other hand, this could be the smartest place I've done one of these weekly updates. I'm sitting in my car. <laughs> sitting in the car, which, okay, the, the crazy bit is I am rushed. I'm about to go away again. I have left this too late. I'm yet to miss one of these updates, and I'm not going to be starting today. So, all right, not particularly well planned. On the other hand, I'm in a soundproof box, like a proper soundproof box. And in fact, just as I was setting up the iPhone, which is like literally sitting on a tripod there in front of the steering wheel, uh, I remembered that there were Pluralsight authors who would actually go and record in their car because it was the best soundproof box that they had. So maybe not so crazy. It'll be interesting to see how the sound quality works out on this one. The engine is running because it's Australia, it's almost summer, it's also bloody hot. So uh, we'll see how it all works out. Anyway, it's not going to be a long one because there's not a whole heap of stuff, but there were a few things this week which I thought were... Uh, let's say super amusing and something else which is just, I think, interesting uh, industry news-wise. Before that, just as I was going through my tweets trying to find what was relevant, I did see one from me about Scott Helm's workshop. So Scott Helm is running my Hack Yourself... With, what am we doing? My Hack Yourself First workshop in Amsterdam on December 9 and 10. That's a public event. It's still open. You can get in there and get tickets. So if you're in Amsterdam or accessible to Amsterdam, which is basically most of Europe, go and check that one out. Nice way to finish up just before the Christmas period. Now, let's get on to the crazy because I've got to say, this, this actually belongs in... I did a blog post once called uh, Reckon You've Seen Some Crazy uh, Security Things, Here Hold My Beer. And it was just about like really weird, crazy security shit that I had seen before, particularly around company positions on security and company tweets. Now... This one was particularly good fun. So this is a couple of tweets uh, from a guy with a name that seems very Italian, and it's about an Italian bank uh, called Finico. Now, Finico has... Finico? Maybe it's Fineco. I don't know. If you're Italian, tell me how I've stuffed this up. Anyway, regardless, apparently they've got like 1.3 million customers or something in Italy, which I would assume makes them a relatively sizable bank. Uh, banks, of course, as we know, are famous for bank-grade security. I should air quote this, bank-grade security, which is meant to be a higher level of security. When someone says bank-grade, we normally expect it to be better. Anyway, the thread is worth a read. I'm going to link to it in my references. But here's the first thing. This is the crazy that got me. So he tweets this, and he says, uh, this is Giorgio bon Bonfigio. Giorgio. Uh, anyway, Giorgio says, a well-known online bank in Italy, Fineco, let's call them Fineco, is A, limiting the max password length to eight chars. Not completely unusual at banks. I wrote recently about how we can't just judge a bank entirely on this arbitrary minimum length. Uh, where he does say, it's a red flag as hashes have consistent length. Y yeah, but none of them are eight characters. Uh, an MD5 hash is 32 characters, a SHA-1 hash is 40 characters. Uh, eight characters indicates that it's probably not being hashed and there's something else going on. Legacy, read the old blog post about banks. Anyway, B, this is, and this is the kicker, suggesting you should Google your password to ensure it's unique. They literally have a recommendation in here when you're choosing your password that you should Go to Google, search for your password, and if it appears less than 10 times on Google, you should actually go ahead and use that password. This is like actual bank guidance. This is insane. This is absolutely insane. I have never seen anyone say this before. Now, by all means, go to Pwn Passwords on Have I Been Pwned and see if it's there because it implements an anonymity model. You never send me the password. Even so, be careful about putting your password into some other foreign website. But to, like, Google it, Okay, first of all, to send the entire password off to Google, number one, and B, to assume that if there are less than 10 results, it's okay to use. Like, what if there's nine results, right? It's some crappy password, but it's only been seen nine times. Does that mean you get to use it? Like, this doesn't make any sense. This is just nuts. So that was crazy. Now, the, the, the other crazy bit on this uh, is they then say, or they don't say, apparently they do, if you want to change your password, it's 0.95 euros to change your password. There is a financial penalty for changing your password. Now, 
we all have different views on how frequently passwords should be changed. Uh, we have seen a lot of commentary recently from the likes of the NCSC saying do not mandate password changes on people because it causes bad practices. This is different to an individual having the right to change their password, for example, if they feel it's been compromised. Maybe they use the same shift password everywhere and they've just got a data breach notification from have I been pwned and it's like, hey, your password is out there. So that's like a perfect example of where people would legitimately want to change their password. Why would you put up a financial barrier? You want to encourage the ability to do that. Also, why would you put up a financial barrier? Like, is this a monetization strategy on their behalf? Because there is surely, surely, oh God, I hope, no human effort involved in actually updating a password. So why the necessity from the bank to charge money for it? This is just nuts. In fact, it's so nuts that they earned themselves a story from Lorenzo on Vice. So the headline here on Vice is, this bank had, had, because they have apparently changed this now, this bank had the worst password policy we've ever seen. This is not where you want to be the superlative of something, you know? Like you don't want Vice popping up and going, yeah, right, this bank had the blah worst. Wow. So this is all terrible. Now something else happens in here. I think they've actually gone through and then decided not to do this anymore. Uh, charges fees for customers, 95 euro, which is around one US dollar or 2.95 British pounds. Really? Wow. Oh. Those maths don't work. Let's just agree they're charging money for it. Um, they require, apparently require customers to set up a second factor. That's good. Uh, oh, there's a tweet from, Quote from me here, Troy Hunt, who maintains the data breach archive and alert service, have I been pwned, was also shocked by these policies. What the fuck? Hunt tweeted. Thank you, Lorenzo. It's not my finest uh, insightful quote, but relevant all the same, I stand by my WTF. So, good on, uh, good on Fine Co for getting themselves a little bit of coverage there. Again, really not the sort of coverage they want. Now, that was Fine, <laughs> fine Co. Uh, something else which has sort of been doing the rounds this week and it just I'm gonna have a little bit of a bias here I hope it's not perceived as a commercial bias but let me explain one password so one password my favorite password manager the one that I have used since 2011 now all the way back in 2011 I wrote the blog post the only secure password is the one you can't remember I looked at a bunch of them I chose one password because it worked on all my devices the usability was good I thought the implementation was neat the security was cool all the rest of it uh, where were we? Eight years ago now. Now that was six years after they started. So one password has been running for the last 14 years. Now, fast forward through to earlier last year, I partnered with one password. They've got product placement on Have I Been Pwned, so they do pay money for that. So I do have some level of commercial relationship with them. Let's just be clear about that. Now, one of the, the interesting things is, is that partly due to that relationship and partly just because we're in the same industry and we catch up a bit, I've spent a heap of time with people from 1Password over the years. And these days when people sort of say, look, why would you use 1Password or what made me choose that? I say, well, look, you know, one of the big reasons is I trust the people. So I have good relationships with the people. We've had beers together and had all sorts of discussions in various parts of the world. And I've got a really, really high degree of confidence that they genuinely, genuinely, genuinely want to do the right thing. There are other password managers who I won't name here where every single time I've had a discussion with them it's been a marketing droid. You know, someone who's been there for a year or so, they're owned by some other great behemoth of an organization that really just sees dollars and cents and that is their primary focus. And it's always been a different model with the one password folks. In all sorts of ways I can't talk about here but I've just always had this genuine, genuine respect that they really want to do the right thing. Now, one of the things that I, I did learn over the course of this year, uh, having spent a bit more time with them in different places, is that they have entirely bootstrapped the entire business from day one. So there are no other shareholders out there that are, that are um, uh, VCs or angel funds or things like this. They've literally bankrolled the whole thing themselves over the last 14 years. And to have reached the scale that they have, having not taken external money, is really rather commendable. Now that has changed as of about three days ago based on my watch, probably two days ago given that that's American time. And they have taken $200 million worth of funding from Excel. Now for a, what is effectively a Series A, the first round of funding, $200 million is an absolutely insanely huge figure. That is a vast amount of money and it is for a minority stake. 
in one password. So it gives you a bit of a sense of how much they're actually worth now as well, which again is really impressive for something just bootstrapped off their own back. Now I shared this earlier on, and I can't remember exactly what I said, but I was positive about it insofar as that obviously gives them a lot of money to build more features in terms of the product, expand more, get more people using password managers, hopefully get more password manager use in the enterprise as well. They have offerings in that space. It's still crazy how many enterprises put up all the posters and they say, make sure you always use unique, secure passwords across all of your services. Good luck, you know, there's like no tools to actually help them do that. Uh, so they've been adding more and more features around the enterprise over the recent years and I assume that this funding will allow them to expand more into there and hopefully do more uh, for people like myself and probably you as well who are just normal home users too. So I tweeted very positively because having spent time with the folks there, I know that they're going to do the right thing with the money. At least that's my experience to date. Don't hang me later on if it turns out differently, but I don't think it will. Now, I was just surprised that a, a bunch of people were really upset about this. And I, I would hear things like, oh, look, at this company over here took funding and then they became really commercial and now look what happened to them. And they'll point at companies that are really successful. And I, I don't want to I don't want to sort of name them here because then people pick one particular thing that this organization did which was you know, not as good and then they'll go, ah, I see what money does here. But it just seemed to be a, a default derogatory negative response from a lot of people. And look, the reality is, is that we're going to have to give it time before we can make this judgment. You know, we've got to come back to this, say fragments like three years from now and go, okay, what have they actually done? Have we got more in terms of the features? Is it a better product? Do we like using it more? Uh, or have they used users as an opportunity to then ratchet up the cost and people unhappy about it? I don't think it's going to be the latter because I think that the moral compass, for one for a better term, uh, that one password is guided by, is going to keep taking it in the right direction. Plus, the VC is still a minority shareholder as well. So you would imagine that the leadership of one password still has ultimate say over the way this thing's going to go. So, again, I'm judging my opinions here purely on the people within the organization and their track record to date. Uh, I don't see that this is a bad thing. I don't have any reason to believe it's a bad thing. There were a few people who said, you know, look, they're unhappy with 1Password's subscription model. They don't like the fact that there is an ongoing payment. Now, just about every product that I can think of of significance, uh, Microsoft Office, uh, uh, Adobe Creative Cloud, don't hate me for that. I know they had their issues the other day. Uh, big services that I regularly use, or big products I regularly use, are increasingly going to subscription model. Now, there's all sorts of reasons why companies like that, such as recurring revenue. There's all sorts of reasons why I like that, such as a lower get-in price and the fact that I get to keep products up to date. The point is that this is becoming a normal model for software delivery. It's certainly not something that you throw one company under the bus for. A few people were unhappy about the fact that um, one password is obviously driving more towards synchronized key change. So key change that sync across devices and don't just live on one. I saw one tweet today where someone was unhappy about that because one password had sort of said, look, we, we keep seeing problems where people uh, lose their device or they get a new device and then they wipe the old one and they haven't migrated their keychain, and that causes major problems. And yeah, and like remember that the vast, vast, vast bulk of users of a product like this are going to be your average everyday consumers who people like me have pushed towards using a password manager yet are not really savvy enough to necessarily know how to do migration of the things. How many people lose access to their 2FA when they roll over a phone? I've seen this happen to family members. It happened to me for God's sake when I rolled over to this new iPhone 11 Pro the other day. Now fortunately I still have the old phone and I haven't wiped it yet but I'm having a hell of a time migrating one particular authenticator app from the old phone to the new phone. So the point is a lot of this stuff is hard and we're talking about an organisation that's trying to find solutions that aren't just security centric but are people centric as well. And if you're in the boat where look you don't want to pay ongoing revenue or subscription fees or you don't want to have a model that actually synchronises via a cloud service then go and use something else. There are other products out there. It doesn't seem to me to be a reason to be negative about the fact that this is the right model that works for them. Now, again, I declared commercial interest. <laughs> this is not to sort of say this is a like totally commercially driven opinion, but this is just the, the model or the market that this product fits into. And if that is not your model and your market, well, use something else. But I think they're doing the right thing based on the audience that they're trying to appeal to. 
I hope that made sense. I just want to raise it here because it came up a lot. Let's not just jump to negative conclusions because the organisation has now finally for the first time actually got some funding from outside behind them. Okay, so that is that. Now, sponsorship. Speaking of uh, sponsors and commercial interests, this week I do have a new sponsor. It's iVPN. And I like the way they've positioned this. So, so iVPN is obviously a VPN provider. They say mass surveillance is a reality. Uh, that is a very fair conclusion. I think we all agree with that. A VPN can't solve this issue, but it's a great first step. Use one that puts principle before profit. Now, I like the position iVPN have taken where they've said, hey, you know what, you get a VPN, it doesn't make you anonymous. Like, this is not the way VPNs work. I do hate it when we see some VPN providers pop up there and go, just turn our thing on and then you're anonymous and invisible. And it's like, well, yeah, that doesn't really solve the problem when you go to a website and you enter all your personal information. You're like, you know, you're not really anonymous then. Uh, there are all sorts of different edge cases where it doesn't necessarily make you anonymous. So I like the fact that they're putting things in a very rational position. Uh, so big thanks to iVPN, new sponsor for this week. You'll see them around a bit more in the future as well. Uh, if you do not have a VPN already, do get one because there are all sorts of different cases where they make an awful lot of sense. So that's it for this week. I, I hope the acoustics and everything have worked okay here. I can see some lights sort of going on and off in this car park, which may have messed things up a little bit. I did try to get the mood lighting with the lights in the car working fine. Uh, we'll see. I'm going to at my first opportunity, actually go and edit this up and publish it, and we'll see what it looks like. And I will try to do this from a better location next week. Uh, thank you for watching this very different one.